I V M. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories. India's very own travel podcast where each week we discuss the story of travelers in their own words and relive their experiences with you our listeners. Hi guys, welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories. Hope you're all well and keeping safe. On the podcast today, we speak with a good friend, Ayush Khanna, as we go back in time and speak about a watershed moment in India's history. A place at the heart of these events and how ayush is connected to that place so let's hop on to the episode and find out more habits routines how exactly do they help us get better well to simplify it for you tune in to the habit coach podcast i am ashtin doctor and i'm going to be here to help you get better daily with some simple easy to do habits that you can easily adapt to your life So tune in to the Habit Coach podcast from Monday to Friday because I believe that awesome lives start with awesome habits. So with that introduction, we'd love to welcome a fellow traveler and friend, Ayush Khanna to the Musafir Stories. Hey Ayush, thank you so much for agreeing to be on the Musafir Stories podcast and welcome. Hi Saif, thank you very much for having me. Glad to have you Ayush and uh, like we were just chatting before for our recording. It's been a while. Ayush and I actually first met um, Ayush Faz and I actually first met on one of the many walks around uh, Bangalore, these heritage walks around Bangalore that we used to take part usually as a part of uh, Sahapedia I think, but even otherwise uh, and uh, we have to thank Sujata, ma'am, I think, for uh, right. uh, making this happen. So that's where our first interaction started and really, really glad to have um, Ayush on the podcast today. But Ayush, before we uh, jump into the conversation and talk a little bit more, why don't you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself and uh, what you do and your interests as well? Sure, sir. Thank you. So I, uh, as you described, I'm a traveler. I love traveling to new places. and i have a specific focus on history and culture when i visit these places so i like to explore their history and i like to write about it so i've started a blog called white lotus style where i write about these places and uh, how the history of those places continues to play out in the present we'll definitely make sure to include uh, links to Ayush's blog as well in the show notes so uh, all our listeners can check it out um, and i i personally am very eagerly looking forward to our conversation today as well ayush uh, especially having had these conversations with you in the past and also following your uh, posts on social media etc really looking forward to uh, where you're taking us to today on the podcast so without much ado tell us a little bit more about uh, the point of interest and uh, the place or the places that you'll be covering today yeah so i'll be talking to you about kanpur and lucknow and the reason why i wanted to talk to you about uh, these two cities is that although there's a lot of value in visiting a place for the first time and you know it opens up uh, so many new experiences and learnings for you as a traveler but with kanpur and lucknow my relationship is different in the sense that these are two cities that i have been visiting every summer vacation uh, as a child and when you visit a place again and again and you reacquaint your relationship with those two with those places again and again you you establish a different kind of a relationship with those with those places uh, it's less like peeling an onion than making it you know every time you visit it a new layer gets added uh to your relationship with the place and that is what i feel about my relationship with these two cities that it's uh it's deeper than visiting a place for the first time and that's why i wanted to talk to you about uh, about these two cities and yeah. that is one mm-hmm. reason uh the other reason of course is that when it comes to kanpur especially uh the city tends to be in the news for all the wrong reasons you know uh sure. it's either the place where the ganga is the most polluted or mm-hmm. it is the place where the air pollution is the worst or it is the place where load shedding is 
is a huge problem and their power cuts for hours on end so it's in the news for all the wrong reasons and i thought that i could perhaps show you and the listeners a different side of kanpur uh, because i have never heard in all my time of talking to travelers of someone saying that you know i'm taking some time off from work and i'm going to kanpur it it just <laughs> it just never happens it's not one of those places you go to but if by some quirk of fate you or the listeners find yourself in the city hopefully something i can tell you can make you see a different side of it <laughs> definitely thank you thank you so much ayush and i completely agree um, especially places like uh, you said right you've been visiting every summer vacation like uh, even like we colloquially say the nanial or the dadial right, right. Uh, <laughs> so looking to hear more from you as to how your experiences have been and uh, what are the different uh, things about these places that you have unearthed over your several visits there um just adding a little bit more in terms of context uh, setting to listeners who might not know right uh, obviously lucknow is a little bit more popular of the two so people might know but uh, just geographically would you like to uh, set some context as to where these two are situated to sure so these two cities are just 80 kilometers away from each other they are twin cities uh-huh. and uh, they they are in central uttar pradesh kanpur is on the banks of the ganga lucknow is on the banks of the gomti river these two cities uh, have been a part of the erstwhile avadh kingdom but after the mutiny of course all of avadh was controlled by the british yeah and definitely i think uh, that's a good segue as well talking a little bit more about the historical context of the two places also and the different threads that connected them and how they kind of separated or not separated they went in their own trajectories after uh, the mutiny right that's also an important piece of um, the whole puzzle uh, uh, let's discuss that a little bit more ayush because historically these two places are quite significant right uh, and obviously the uh, 1857 revolt or the first war of independence as we call it that's an important connecting thread for the two cities as well uh, would you like to touch a little bit upon that and um, the history is associated to um, to these places yeah sure sir so the mutiny was the most uh, seminal moment in the histories of both kanpur and lucknow i mean it was the case in most cities where it played a role but especially so for kanpur and lucknow it's it's the most watershed moment nothing comes close not even 1947 there's a pre mutiny and post mutiny story to both the cities let me just begin with uh, kanpur briefly talking about what things were like pre mutiny so in kanpur in the 1770s the british took control of the city after the battle of baksar uh, when the avadh kingdom was reduced in size kanpur went to the british and they established their garrison there so up until the mutiny it was a garrison city for the east india company and lucknow on the other hand was still controlled by the nawabs so kanpur had the british garrison and the best person to read i think about pre 1857 kanpur i think would be uh, fanny parks who was a very spirited woman who traveled across north india often alone in uh, mm-hmm. the late 1820s and early 1830s and she has left a first hand account of what kanpur was like at the time she spent time both in kanpur and lucknow and if anyone is interested in knowing what north india was like at that time hers is a very good uh, first hand account so kanpur was there was an indian side uh, there was an indian um, uh, residential area and there was a british residential area where the east india company officials and their families lived the civil lines were getting established and so on so leading up to the mutiny that was what kanpur was a garrison uh, town i mean it had a history uh before the british came uh, it was a smaller village called kanhepur but it was only after the british came that things really started changing rapidly for for kanpur and uh, bithur on the other hand is also very important to kanpur's story because bithur was where before the mutiny the erstwhile peshwa the maratha peshwa was exiled so mm-hmm. the british you know self they did this all the time they deposed uh, they won battles they deposed rulers and they sent those rulers to different parts of the world or the country so that they would be away from their traditional power bases they sent the king of burma to coastal maharashtra they sent uh, yeah. uh, the last mughal 
uh, Bahadur Shah Zafar to Burma, and uh, after the after the defeat of the Marathas, the Peshwa was de- deposed and exiled to Bithur. Bithur is also mm-hmm. on the banks of the Ganga. It's very close to Kanpur, and uh, Bithur is where. Nana Rao was so. Nana Rao is a very important person for Kanpur when it comes to 1857 because he was the adopted heir of the Peshwa. The problem that Nana Rao faced was, in some sense, similar to the problem that the Rani of Jhansi faced leading up to 1857, which was that the British were not recognizing him as a legitimate heir to the Peshwa, right. mm-hmm. and that meant that he would not be eligible. for the pension that the east india company was giving the peshwa and uh, this was why leading up to 1857 he had become a very dangerous figure for the british because he was this disgruntled man who had by then built up some sort of a local support and um, when 1857 when the mutiny began and the uprising started to spread he saw different options for him opening up mm-hmm. so that was what kanpur was looking like as 1857 approached yeah uh, definitely i think that's an uh, important call out and also obviously the 57 mutiny started off with meerut but uh, right. kanpur turned out to be one of the the turning points of the mutiny as well right uh, uh, and also the kind of uh, actions taken by uh, nana saheb as well as the repercussions those had those also left like quite the significant impact um so please walk us through that a little bit more and uh, what the important places as well were uh, in that lead up to the conflict and uh, then obviously the reaction to that by the britishers etc ayush if if you can please sure self so uh, what i'll do is i'll just tell you a story so just bear with me but this mm-hmm. story sort of connects all the areas and places in kanpur connected to 1857 so i feel that it'll it'll do a very good job of linking all these places in one go yeah definitely so a couple of years back i was at my grandparents place and i was uh, booking a cab for lucknow an outstation cab and i noticed something very odd which was that the street adjacent to the house was named baron carlo marochetti road now i found this very odd because i expected it to have a formal name we knew it as dudwali gali because you know that's where there was a cow shed where we used to get milk from <laughs> but um, i did not expect like an italian sounding name that to a baron and all so i got curious and i started looking for this person and looking for this person sort of revealed his connection to the city as well as the his connection with all other parts of the city that were affected by the mutiny so when 1847 happened when the mutiny began in kanpur all the british were put in what was known as the wheelers entrenchment uh wheelers entrenchment is named after general hugh wheeler who was the leader of the kanpur garrison at the time now this entrenchment was what was uh, the focus of nana rao's attack in 1857 so nana rao had joined the rebels mm-hmm. because he was disgruntled as we discussed and his rebels were constantly attacking the uh, entrenchment the british held out for for a surprisingly long amount of time for 15 days but their situation was really really bad they were low on food water people were dying of diseases it was a horrible situation most books historical fiction books that i've read on the mutiny you know they discuss the siege of the wheelers entrenchment books like uh, zamindar by valerie fitzgerald for example and it was a very uh, difficult situation for them so they were forced to sue for some sort of an agreement with nana rao and the agreement was that they would uh, be given safe passage to british controlled allahabad and the only condition was that they need to vacate kanpur so these close to 500 british men women and children they were taken to what was then known as sati chaura ghat where the these boats were prepared for their passage to allahabad and the men were put on the boats first they boarded the boats first and when these boats reached the middle of the river the rebels who were on the banks they opened fire on the boats mm. and uh, you can imagine the scene because there would have been british women and children on the banks witnessing this there were uh, british men you know jumping out of the boats trying to save their lives and rebels on horseback entering the river trying to cut them down and only three british men escaped that because the ganga had taken their boat further downstream 
and it is from their accounts that we know a lot of what happened during the mutiny at the time so this massacre ghat of course is uh, still there it has a it has a temple and given the incident that took place then it's completely haunted as you can imagine sure. uh, lots of uh, ghost stories around it and uh, that incident then led to the remaining women and children who were uh, there they were taken to what is known as bibi ghar Mm-hmm. So Bibi Ghar was a place in the civil lines where Nana Rao had kept these women and children and the understanding was that he had kept them there because he wanted to use them as a bargaining chip with the other british forces who would come to uh, attack Kanpur but clearly something changed i think they understood that this was not going to work the strategy wasn't going to work uh because then a decision was taken a fateful decision was taken to kill all the women and children in bibi ghar they were mm-hmm. around close to 200 and all and uh, when they were killed their bodies were dumped in a nearby well now this well it now forms what is a part of nana rao park in kanpur okay okay when the british came they were uh, they were expected to relieve the women and children but instead they found remnants of uh, very gory uh, murder in that house in mm-hmm. bibigar and then they learned of the fact that all their bodies had been dumped in the well no event in the mutiny affected and traumatized the british as much as the massacre in bibigar mm-hmm. they were uh, enraged to the point where they they used that as a pretext to suspend the rule of law and they executed anybody who in kanpur who could not account for their whereabouts during the two massacres mm-hmm. that meant that thousands of people were killed without any due process or anything of that sort they were i say sepoys who had defected were blown from cannons and it was a way just yeah. just kanpur in those months uh, saw a lot of bloodshed so the well where the british women and children were uh, their bodies were thrown that uh, ground was consecrated almost as sacred ground in a sense mm-hmm. so lady canning who was the wife of the then governor general lord canning uh, she decided that this needs to there needs to be a memorial built here to commemorate the dead and uh, she had uh, known the wife of this baron carlo marochetti in uh, in paris when they were children and as a result he was appointed to make that sculpture so this sculpture is basically that of an angel it's uh, an angel made out of white marble the angel is holding two palm leaves across its chest and it's looking mournfully down on the well on which it was placed mm-hmm. uh, and uh, this whole this angel the statue of the angel as well as the carved barricades around the angel they were together known as the konpo memorial this konpo memorial was visited by europeans in the 19th century more than the taj mahal was it it, it left such a deep impact on the british and even successive uh, literature that emerged from the raj that was influenced by what happened in kanpur at the time but in 1947 when india gained independence and by the way this konpo memorial right it was mm-hmm. completely paid for by indians by uh, people in kanpur by uh, through punitive taxes some 30000 rupees in in that times money was raised mm-hmm. for making the konpo memorial but no indian was allowed to visit it it was completely secluded and meant only for european eyes so in that sense you know this uh, the konpo memorial was it reflected their collective grief but it was also a symbol of their triumph in the mutiny yeah. uh, which meant that when 1947 happened and india gained independence one of the first things that the people of Kan- kanpur did was to reclaim that space they entered that space sure. they removed the Ka- the kanpur memorial from there and they placed it in all souls church which is a church in the cantonment area in, in kanpur it's a beautiful church so if you happen to be in kanpur please do visit it it's a colonial church which was built specifically to commemorate the victory in 1857 and it's the only such church built during that time so that just gives you an idea of how important kanpur was to 1857 and what happened then so kanpur memorial now actually stands in in the church in the church land okay. and it's re- and not in the original place where the british had placed it that place is now part of as i mentioned nana rao park it's called now mm-hmm. after the man who must have given the order for the killing of the women and children and it also has other statues of freedom fighters there 
so i through the story i just wanted to you know when i found out about this baron and then found out that he had sculpted the konpo memorial uh, i was from from my discussion with friends and relatives who live in the city they also don't know about it i think this is just something that uh, we don't go over a lot the way yeah. the way decolonization took place in in kanpur uh, it was quite surface level mm-hmm. and the fact that you know this park was renamed in this way and the fact that the italian sounding name of the road was just left <laughs> because yeah. people maybe didn't make the connection with why that name is there today yeah um, yeah who would have thought dudwali gali has so much <laughs> underneath right in terms of the connections in the stories but yeah just fascinating right <clears throat> uh, obviously some of these stories are uh, horrific in the sense of the massacres and everything involved but really like you said watershed moments in um, history and uh, specifically the 1857 mutiny yeah. um and because the, you know remember kanpur became a slogan yeah. for the british after that yeah i mean not just yeah. limited to kanpur it was used as a justification for ruthlessly quelling the mutiny across the gangetic plain yeah remember kanpur yeah. apparently was uh, war cry yeah. uh, during that mutiny uh, but yeah really really significant that uh, what i was uh, going to say earlier was that uh, in our really superficial um, touch on this subject during our academics i don't know perhaps in uh, one of our uh, grades in school uh, not a lot goes into this but yeah if you dig deep down there's uh, definitely a lot more in terms of uh, connections and stories uh, that will make uh, reading up something about this like so much more interesting right uh, and also the kanpur memorial from where it was initially to where it is now etc it, uh, the story actually gives like a good connection and a background about that too so thank you for calling it out and also uh, just wanted to touch upon bithur right like you mentioned very uh, significant in that nana sahib or nana rao uh, was placed there mm. right uh, after in exile but uh, while looking it up i saw that uh, it was even very um, popular from a religious perspective and before that uh, because it's believed to be the birthplace of love and kush um, the children of ram so that we also uh, bithur ganga as they call it the banks very very um, significant to um, uh, from a religious perspective as well was uh, what i was trying to touch upon uh, but anyway uh, that's really interesting from uh, the perspective of kanpur uh, and in the meantime how would you like to uh, uh, quickly portray a picture of what's going on in lucknow during this time ayush yeah sure self so in lucknow what happened let me just talk about pre mutiny briefly and then we'll talk about mm-hmm. you know the mutiny itself so pre mutiny what's happening in lucknow is that at the time when kanpur becomes a garrison city for the british lucknow on the other hand is seeing its uh, nawabi phase right mm-hmm. what we ref- what we associate with lucknow traditionally even today so yeah. what started this actually is an interesting incident which is well not an incident but an in- interesting sort of a relationship which is that it was only when asif uddola moved from faizabad to lucknow lucknow's nawabi era started in a sense and the mm-hmm. reason he moved to lucknow was actually because his mother bahu begum was mm-hmm. a very powerful woman and he kind of felt stifled under her shadow <laughs> he wanted to be his own man he didn't want her to control what he was doing and uh, she was very powerful in fezabad she owned a lot of land she was a very wealthy woman so he decided to move to lucknow to gain some sort of an autonomy and uh, that moved lucknow of asafuddola in 1775 or there about i think uh, 1770s that began the nawabi era of lucknow because Vaj, because asafuddola is now focusing on lucknow right he yeah. now wants to make lucknow the premier city of uh, of india at the time and he builds a lot of what we now associate with lucknow and what we commonly know with regards to lucknow we architecture right like the bada imam bada is famous sure. then the chota imam bada the rumi darwaza these are iconic structures of lucknow that were built by asafuddola and in fact hmm. they used to say of him because the building of the imambada is supposed to have started during a period of uh, famine 
दे से ऑफ हिम दैट जिसको ना दे मौला उसको दे आसफ उदौला या that is the saying in lucknow even today people remember it uh, and yeah. that that was associated with him because of the construction works that he began as a means of uh, uh, as a means of addressing the famine at least beginning to address it so um, he is a very important figure in lucknow's history and leading up after asafuddaullah you had several uh, several nawabs a series of uh, nawabs uh, leading up to the other very famous nawab of lucknow i mean uh, we know wajid ali shah right he uh, we sure. know him as the last nawab of lucknow and mm-hmm. wajid ali shah had only about 10 years as the nawab of lucknow uh, because then the mutiny happened so he became nawab around the 1840 late 1840s 47 48 and then in 56 he was deposed and sent to calcutta right that is the story of lucknow leading up to the uh, mutiny itself and we can talk about what happens once the mutiny began yeah uh, i mean lucknow and it's uh, i mean you could call asafuddaullah as the architect of lucknow right because uh, although even before that it has been a place of importance it's, the, it's just that then get as much attention and once he decided to move the capital that's when all of the architectural marvels that we see today those came um, uh, those came into the picture with asafuddaullah starting with him and uh, went on from nawab to nawab uh, after after him but uh, in terms of the mutiny obviously uh, like we called out kanpur was like a watershed moment but uh, well, what were the implications in uh, lucknow as a part of this mutiny ayush yeah so the the contrast between the two cities and the impact of the mutiny on the two cities is quite quite stark actually because in in kanpur the mutiny led to the establishment of kanpur as the manchester of uh, of the east they used to call kanpur mm-hmm. because manufacturing took off in a big way but in lucknow the the memory of 1857 is very different the mm-hmm. memory of 1857 is one of uh, a decline of tragedy because it brought to end the nawabi era of lucknow when um, and and everything we associate with lucknow uh, sort of stops then you know it it's like a, uh, it's like a year that brought it all to a standstill and then from that period onwards it just continued to decay and this is not to say that the city didn't grow of course it grew in other ways but what we associate with the city like for example i was talking about wajid ali shah wajid ali shah in his last years this dream land that he was building this dream com- palace complex of his which we know as kesar bag mm-hmm. that uh, was supposed to be a very beautiful palace complex in in lucknow and uh, after the mutiny happened uh, the there were it, it's, it's almost as if the british uh, took out their anger of the mutiny on some of these structures in lucknow because this kesar bagh complex was uh, was treated in such a horrible manner you know there were roads made mm. uh, in the middle of the palace complex and uh, all sorts of demolitions took place and even today some some parts of kesar bagh still exist and out of nowhere you'll see this beautiful structure in lucknow and you you'll not have any, any idea of what that used to used to uh, be a part of you know a part of a larger complex but uh, that's what it has done you know the the british then used these structures in a very uh, very haphazard manner treated them very badly uh, demolished them at at uh, in in random ways the lucknow as a city itself uh, was traumatized by the mutiny because uh, a lot of the people actually left the city as a result of mm-hmm. of the turmoil and the tumult that was happening uh, my family included actually uh, the okay. family home that we have in lucknow in old lucknow in the chowk area that home was uh, vacated and the whole family left just like so many others did in this in fact uh, there's a film by shashi kapoor called junoon mm-hmm. and junoon captures this uh, this period uh, the tumult of 1857 in lucknow so anyone interested should watch it and there's a scene where you know everyone is leaving lucknow at the end so that's what happened actually it was just a very uh, turbulent uh, sort of an event and um, what happened after uh, the mutiny is uh, you know there were other sorts of growth that took place uh, because the british came and they established different sorts of institutions and uh, 
those things continued those trends continued but what we associate with lucknow uh, in terms of its architecture that ended with the nawabi era and even though of course the city continues to grow uh, because it's the capital of modern day uttar pradesh nawabi architecture itself is uh, most of it is disappearing quickly yeah it's definitely sad uh, and also like it's also interesting to see how uh, different trajectories both of these uh, cities took right after the mutiny and um, i'm actually kind of still surprised by the amount of industrialization that kanpur went through in that uh, duration after the mutiny as well and uh, still one of the i guess identifying features of kanpur is the industries and especially the textiles and the tanneries even today mm-hmm. right uh, like you said uh, almost set out to be called as the manchester of the east yeah um a lot of the structures also uh, right the these big mills that came up after uh, on one hand like i said uh, lucknow is recognized by these uh, nawabi architecture and the structures uh, the bell during that time but for kanpur a lot of the ones the beautiful um, structures i do see is in this era right that came up in this era things like the elgin mill and the yeah. uh, the popular lalimli mill i think right it's yeah. also very beautiful when you take a closer look and a closer lens at uh, events and how they panned out for two different cities and not even like separated by 100 mi- 100 kilometers right the two yeah. of them uh, it's really interesting to see it through that lens yeah. uh, so thank you for kind of calling that out ayush let's take a quick commercial break here and we'll be right back on the other side Namaste this is Cyrus Brocha I am part of the government cancel culture program to remove rubbish off all the different streams available so what we have is all the collected rubbish we put together on our show it's called Cyrus says it's on IVM podcast you have to watch it and listen to it it's on our app it's on our website it's on the youtube channel it's on facebook there are many different ways don't bother me and ask me how uh, you have to find out we talk to different personalities many of them are known some are just people we meet downstairs and invite them up for chai but the point is it's fun and it's very therapeutic so please join in and listen to cyrus says all right we are back from the commercial break talking to ayush khanna about kanpur and lucknow and how um he spent time visiting those places and covering off some milestone events connected to these places and more and ayush if uh, there's any additional structures within these two cities i know there's uh, no dearth of important structures especially in lucknow but uh, any um, any ones of important that you'd like to call out yeah so in lucknow for example there are many despite the decline there are many structures that are worth visiting you know one of them i would recommend is one that i visited only on the last uh, occasion that i went to lucknow which is uh, this kothi called uh, kothi roshan uddola so this uh, kothi is very mm-hmm. interesting because uh, it was made by someone who is a bit idiosyncratic in the sense that usually you know with uh, lucknowi nawabi architecture there's a sense of symmetry that is explained by this phrase called sawal yeah. jawab where um, if you have you know like a mm-hmm. minaret somewhere then the opposite end of it you will have another minaret as a jawab that suggests uh-huh. a kind of symmetry <laughs> in the architecture you know but uh, the man who built uh, kothi roshan uddola decided to completely do away with that uh, you know he's like i don't believe in all this <laughs> i'm just going to make something and uh, it's it's still an extremely impressive structure uh, it's so beautiful but it doesn't follow that symmetrical pattern that you usually associate so just to look at something different which is nonetheless nawabi uh, i would suggest uh, kothi roshan uddola for sure just take a look at it that is one the other is of course the the much better known uh, residency where the british resident lived this was built by the nawabs for the british residents so it was made in the british style but uh, mm. it's a very haunting place i mean i i just enjoy going there because i like the fact that they haven't tried to build it back in a way you know it's just left uh, almost like it was at the end of the mutiny it feels like that with the uh, the bullet holes and mm. the cannon holes and so on and uh, there there are other nawabi structures in lucknow which don't have the same prestige as you know something like a bada imam bada but i hope that the government does mm-hmm. pay more attention to them in 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 maintaining them because 
they are disappearing at a fast at a fast rate there is one known as the kala imam bada and uh, it it i mean it's it's called that because it's made out of black stone and even today people are confused about what purpose it served you know apart from the fact that uh, its color is so distinctive the fact is that so many nawabs were uh, often idiosyncratic about how they wanted to spend their money that they built structures that sometimes were not even completed and uh, just left half finished sometimes mm-hmm. that almost adds to lucknow's uh, lucknow's architecture and charm in a sense uh, one very important structure in lucknow which i won't call nawabi mm-hmm. but it was built by claude martin which is uh, la martinia college it's the most famous college in lucknow it it's school really most of my cousins have studied there and uh, it was built by claude martin who was initially a part of the french east india company mm-hmm. but he was he was very bright and he understood which way the winds were blowing and he joined the uh, english east india company mm-hmm. uh, and made a fortune for himself how we don't know <laughs> but um, he he did and he built this uh, structure what is today la martinia college and in fact claude martin is buried in la martinia college so okay. you can go down it's it's really a tomb i can call it mm-hmm. and uh, you can you can even see uh, copies of his will <laughs> uh, around his uh, around the tomb and uh, la martinia is is very different from the rest of nawab uh, rest of lucknow's architecture because it isn't like i said nawabi right it is yeah. very very strongly influenced it's very strongly influenced by european architecture so is so is nawabi architecture to be honest uh, the nawabs themselves wanted to import a lot of european influences into the architecture but this has very few uh, indian influences la martinia mm-hmm. college and one very interesting thing about la martinia college is that this is where william hodson is buried okay So William Hodson is a very important figure in the mutiny of 1857 uh, because he not only raised the regiment that was then known as Hodson's Horse mm-hmm. which today is also a part of the Indian army in a different avatar mm-hmm. but uh, he is also the man who killed Bahadur Shah Zafar's two sons and one grandson right so he is the he is the man who uh, who was responsible for that and uh, he died later in lucknow in B, in bb ki kothi i think it's called mm-hmm. uh, which is a structure that doesn't exist anymore uh, but hodson's story is very interesting because william hodson was someone who was fairly clear about how ruthless he was in quelling the mutiny and uh, the way he went about it but what is interesting is the way his legacy is used by la martinia today mm. which is to say that you know now there's a house there's a house in his name there's a run you know the, the, the children go on a run in his name there's a wreath laying ceremony now nothing around the structure around the grave of william hodson indicates that he was the one who was responsible for you know killing the last mogul princes of india mm-hmm. so um, just goes to show that I, i think when we use history in this way you know to legitimize the present we do it in ways that work for us yeah. uh, we don't uh, we don't use it in the f- we don't view it in the fullness of of the past is is one thing you can see clearly from william hodson's story he he was also instrumental in the establishment of another famous school in india which is lawrence school sanawar mm-hmm. and uh, they also remember him very fondly uh, without mentioning the fact that he was responsible for the death of the last moguls mogul yeah. princes yeah so um, it tells you a lot when you look at his story and the way his memory is used in the present yeah i know absolutely you know thank you for calling that out as well ayush um ayush any other interesting stories from um your visits there especially to kanpur and uh, the areas and the vicinity that you'd like to add yeah so there's this uh, one uh, graveyard that i wanted to talk about mm-hmm. which is uh, uh what people call gora kabristan okay so gora kabristan is called gora kabristan because it's where white people are buried and it's it's a very old uh, cemetery actually almost as old as the famous uh, south 
Calcutta Cemetery, where uh, South Park, yeah. South Park Cemetery in Calcutta, where a lot of famous uh, people are buried, like William Jones and Henry De Rosio and so on. Mm-hmm. So the Kanpur Cemetery doesn't have such famous names, but it is almost equally old, and uh, it has. Uh, the the architecture of the of the graves are very similar the indo saracenic architecture is very similar to the south park cemetery and uh, one interesting story that is associated with the cemetery is that uh, if you go there at around at night time you know this the there's a ghost story among the locals is that you might encounter a headless uh, englishman <laughs> in hindi, in hindi you, they 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 say he's a sarkata angres uh-huh. all he'll do is that he'll ask you for a cigarette he has no head but he will ask you for a cigarette <laughs> so, oh my god so yeah uh, i want to know i actually want to dig more into this story i want to know oh, is this association with 1857 it must be mm. but uh, I, i this is what i know about the story it's associated with the with the gora kabristan yeah and uh, the other one is that there is the story of a of a sufi so mm-hmm. kanpur also has sufi dargahs Okay. And close to my home there are two which are separated by a distance of about a couple of kilometers. And it is said that on some nights one sufi rides his white horse and visits the other sufi the in uh, in the other dargah. And uh, you should not come in front of this sufi or try and stop him because he will slap you. That's all he'll do. <laughs> <laughs> so so just oh, give man. him the give him way and don't trouble him my aunt swears to have seen the sufi ride on his horse <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she no amount of teasing her about it will change her mind that she saw him this is the story i wanted to share with regards to sufi ghost stories my god yeah very eerie and uh, i'm happy to <laughs> give it a pass and uh, not looking for uh, encounters either with a headless englishman asking for a cigarette or a sufi riding his horse <laughs> but yeah some of these uh, local stories also make um, visits and the experience uh, worthwhile i guess right uh, obviously you like to hear them rather than experience and see them more but yeah just fascinating stories so thank you for sharing those with us ayush now before we uh, jump on to other topics um, one of the very very uh, integral part of the culture here right or especially around in this area is the food of the area as well so would you like to uh, touch upon a few of the i guess unique things both from uh, culinary perspective of um, not just kanpur but also lucknow ayush yeah sure so lucknow is a lot more famous right in terms of its association yeah. again with uh, nawabi culinary culture and uh, for that reason its biryani is one of the more famous biryanis in india you have the hyderabadi mm-hmm. biryani you have uh, you uh, the biryanis in the south now but lucknow biryani has also made a place for itself in this uh, in this list and there are yeah. a few distinctive places i mean there are a few famous places you can go to in old chowk there's this there are two places where i usually go for my biryani one is uh, idris ki biryani it's in chowk it's mm. it's uh, it's excellent i don't know how how else to describe it um, <laughs> there's also lalla ki biryani which is also in uh, it's in chowk lalla ki biryani happens to be closer to our home uh, so mm. i go there more often but both are very very good so these two places should be tried out the other place is that you know it's uh, actually a home kitchen uh it's mm-hmm. it's run by uh, this person called shiba ikbal uh so i'm excited about this new trend that has begun in lucknow which is that people have started realizing that you know this heritage is an important one this culinary heritage and they are beginning to share it with people um so shiba ikbal is one such person who will who whose home you can go to and the ho- and her home is also in chowk actually it's just behind uh, idris ki bihani so that makes it mm. easy although it makes it difficult to decide which one which place to go to uh, <laughs> but uh, shiba's uh, food i mean uh, my brother and i went there last time we were there and uh, uh, some of the distinctive food Uh, that she made was you know the shirmal that is eaten in lucknow it's like a flat bread uh, sure. but uh, it's it has it comes in very different flavors 
the the keema mutter that she made was outstanding and uh, she takes care of making sure that uh, you know there's enough vegetarians as well <laughs> even though meat is what lucknow is famous for uh, the other thing is that there's uh, uh, one particular dessert which uh, you get in lucknow which is known as kali gajar ka halwa which is mm. uh, n- very different from the usual red or orange carrot halwa that you get right it's uh, right. it's made out of black carrot it's just it's more purple actually but it's called kali gajar ka halwa and uh, yeah she made that as well which is uh, and which was very very good because it it's it's not you know uh, too sweet or anything uh, and this kali gajar ka halwa you get in other uh, shops in chok as well i haven't eaten it mm-hmm. in other pa- in other cities uh, i'm guessing there are other cities that make it uh, in up but i have had it in in old lucknow uh, especially so that is one dish you should look out for when you're there next um and there's another thing another in sort of a uh i think it's a restaurant uh but you know what it does is it basically brings together different uh cooks from across lucknow and their food at one place which is nemat khana okay. nemat khana is in kesar bagh that we discussed earlier and uh mm-hmm. it it is where you can go and you can sit and you can eat food from different homes in lucknow i think that's a fabulous concept they have an instagram page yeah. so whoever's interested should just uh, look up nemat khana on instagram and uh, yeah lucknow's food is uh, is is amazing i there are no two ways about it there's there's lots of different <laughs> um people will point you to different uh, places you know based on their own interests and there are so many of them uh like sure. uh, uh bajpai's uh, chai is also quite famous uh, i mean i imagine just tea becoming famous but i mean even <laughs> the assorted snacks that he serves along with it is quite famous uh shukla chaat is famous so these are some very uh, popular places in lucknow where you can go to for food in kanpur on the other hand uh there is um, a lot of excellent chaat which is most famous in kanpur um uh, and sure. uh, besides chaat there is also this place called thaggu ki kulfi uh so oh, yes. thaggu ki kulfi is actually featured in a couple of bollywood bollywood films also uh bunty or <laughs> yeah. bubbly i think although i haven't watched bunty yeah. or bubbly but uh, i know for a fact that it became very popular in kanpur because thaggu ki kulfi featured in it <laughs> yeah aisa koi saga nahi jisko hum ne thaga nahi so that's his tagline <laughs> yeah. even today uh and people uh, love the fact that you know these people can be so brazen about <laughs> uh, yeah. the way they advertise their food but it's excellent because the kind of uh, kulfi he makes is not the traditional you know in the freezer actually it is the traditional way of making it so mm-hmm. if you go there you will see this guy constantly rotating this metal container in which the kulfi is made uh, and it's mm-hmm. it's really really good too and uh, so are his samosas yeah, i think it's called as a badnam kulfi yeah 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 they do all <laughs> that's that called, called. <laughs> and the other tagline that they yeah. use is uh, uh, mehman ko mat chakhana tik jayega <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think uh, that's the kanpur ka attitude also i guess right, right? right, uh, right. they very popular for <laughs> very yeah. brazen and to the point that's right. uh, so that's really nice to see at uh, these uh, food places as well uh, but yeah i'm sorry you were going uh, you were saying something about the samosa yeah 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 the samosas are also uh, just one of the best i have had honestly um mm-hmm. so the other thing about kanpur i want to point out is that i have uh, like probably not eaten better vegetables just just the just mm-hmm. the normal vegetables that you eat uh, as an everyday part of your food the the flavor that kanpur's vegetables have it just seems to be different somehow and i hope it's nothing to do with uh, the, how toxic the river is there <laughs> but uh, yeah. it just is really really good you know when you when you see the ganga and you see the the white banks of the ganga on uh, in the in, in kanpur and you know that's where most of the vegetables are coming from that white alluvial soil maybe it has something to do with you know the the soil there but it's just that mm-hmm. uh, fruits and vegetables taste like nowhere i've had before and uh, uh i think that a lot of these nameless varieties of fruits as well they need to get more attention mm-hmm. because we we focus so much on the mango and even the mango from these yeah. parts is is very famous the sherry mango that comes from malihabad especially yeah. 
Malihabad is close mm-hmm. to Kanpur and Lucknow. Um, it's famous for its mango yeah. orchards and the dasheri mango that grows there. Uh, but um, uh, there's this nameless, there's this variety of guava that I love from uh, from Kanpur, and you'll get it almost throughout the year. Uh, it has mm-hmm. these red spots. I don't think it has a name because I've asked around and no one seems to know. Uh, no one seems to give it a specific name. You know, it just is the guava that you get in Kanpur and Bithur. Uh, but its flavor is really, really good. So if you go to Kanpur, make sure you try the guava there. And uh, the other food uh, experience that I want to mention is that if you travel from Kanpur to Lucknow by road, mm-hmm. you come across closer to Lucknow. In fact. You come across uh, near the Nawab Ganj Bird Sanctuary. There's this dhaba called um, Majak Janani. So if mm-hmm. ever you go to Kanpur Lucknow, stop at this dhaba, because in my view, uh, this dhaba has the best, the second best gulab jamuns I've ever eaten. And I am a very, very picky gulab jamun eater because it's my favorite sweet. I'm a bit snobbish about it. I don't eat gulab jamun wherever I get it, but the gulab jamun in this dhaba is is outstanding. And I make sure that whenever I go to Kanpur, Lucknow, I, I go by road. Uh, even when we were kids, mm-hmm. I would I would make sure we go by road and not by train because mm-hmm. we can stop at this dhaba and uh, eat some gulab jamuns there and take the rest in a handi to be eaten uh, sparingly later on. <laughs> Very interesting. But also begs the question, which is Ayush's favorite or uh, <laughs> the best gulab jamun? So the best is also something, uh, uh, is, is a place actually in uh, in UP. It's called, uh, it's called Megal Ganj. So it's like a small okay. kasba. Magal Ganj is not a place I've been to, but when I on one of my summer vacations, an uncle who worked in the state department had gone to Magal Ganj, and all over UP, you know, it's famous. The gulab jamuns from here are famous. That's what this place is famous for, you know, gulab jamuns. And he brought one handy <laughs> bag just because they were famous. And those uh, cousins of mine who were in Lucknow, they didn't they didn't spare any, uh, they didn't spare a thought for uh, <laughs> their Bangalore cousins yeah. who don't get such gulab jamuns back home. Uh, <laughs> but I've not had such uh, such good gulab jamuns since. So that is the number one on my yeah. list. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah, well, what is a trip to, uh, say, Lucknow? And uh, I mean, we have, now we're discovering more about Kanpur as well, but without food, it's um, like incomplete, right? I would say, and I'm really missing Faiza on this episode. <laughs> she would have been super excited to be talking more about uh, the different cuisines and uh, especially the sweets and things like that. Yeah. It, uh, it'd been great to have her. But uh, yeah, another time. There's always another time and another episode to cover off food, especially food uh, in Lucknow. Right? There's so much more that um, you can always deep, uh, do a deep dive into. Uh, any final thoughts, Ayush, before we start to close this down? Uh, it's already been a, such a roller coaster ride, <laughs> both from um, the events of history and especially a lot of these uh, darker events that you don't get so much visibility into a lot of times to things on the lighter side, things like the food, for example, and also in between these, how two cities with connected histories actually went in uh, really two different ways after that uh, watershed moment. So it's really, really interesting. And uh, thank you for calling that out. But any final thoughts, Ayush, before we sort of wrap this up? Yeah, so um, in terms of their histories, I feel that, you know, while 1857 was the most important uh, event, you had different kinds of uh, growth that took place in both cities. And I and I don't want to make it sound as though, you know, one was a stagnant story and the other was a story of industry. It, I, it isn't as reductive as that, uh, because even in Lucknow, you had... Uh, you had a lot of efflorescence of Urdu literature, you know, from people like mm-hmm. uh, Kuratul and Haider, Ismat Chuktai, uh, Rashid Jahan. These people studied in places like the ITC University, uh, uh, Isabella Thorburn College of Lucknow University. And uh, mm-hmm. so there were lots of different strands of growth that took place. But uh, what I was trying to highlight was the fact that, you know, there was a sense of, there is a continuous sense of decline nonetheless because of what we associate mm-hmm. as distinctively Lucknow. And also, Kanpur, on the other hand, became a city of you know workers because of the manufacturing that took place there in all in Lalimli and all of that, and it attracted a lot of revolutionary activity in the early 20th century. Bhagat Singh visited Kanpur and stayed there for a while because uh, mm-hmm. because that's where the HSRA was based for a time. So there was, in that sense, a difference between the two cities and how they developed uh, after 1857. 
and uh, partition i wanted to say had a huge impact on lucknow more than kanpur because a lot of the gentry mm-hmm. uh, muslim gentry lived in lucknow right and uh, they uh, even the talukdars who lived in uh, say rural up usually had homes in lucknow it affected them quite deeply it affected the city as a result uh, quite deeply and uh, yeah we should have a separate episode on that as well sometime <laughs> Yeah no absolutely absolutely uh but thank you for capturing Kanpur and Lucknow and your memories associated to these places so beautifully and sharing them with us and enlightening even me personally right uh, i know uh, like 1857 mutiny would be like a chapter in our book and uh, probably mangal pandey the movie is what i'd associate it to the most and beyond that it was very very superficial but with this episode i got a chance to actually dig a little deeper into and uh, learn a little bit more about a lot of these events that happened the personalities that were associated with it and also like the implications the aftermath of it etc right um, even from the east india company's perspective it was a watershed because after that point is when uh, the, the british government actually yeah. yeah the raj began right so that was a, as well a really uh, important milestone in um, india's journey towards independence uh, thank you for uh, shedding so much light on uh, these two very important cities ayush it was a pleasure sir it was a pleasure talking to you that was just another great episode on the musafir stories make sure to show us some love by sharing the podcast with your friends and family we are on instagram and twitter at musafir stories if you like this podcast don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can listen to us on the ivm podcast app or the website follow us on our social media we are at ivm podcast on twitter and instagram Hey, everybody, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On Cyrus Says, Cyrus is joined by writer-director Faraz Arif Ansari to talk about their critically acclaimed short films, Sisak, Siberia, and the recent hit, Shir Korma. On The Habit Coach, Ashton introduces us to Avinash Bihar, co-founder of Deep Rooted Company, and his take on the quality of the food and supply chain in India and current trends in the farming sector. On Naan Curry, Sadaf and Achit talk about the humble potato, right from its origin and trade history to the various ways it can be used in dishes and its health benefits. On All Things Policy, Aditya Ramnathan joins Aditya Parekh to discuss the UK's first ever national space strategy document and the lessons it may hold for India. And on Say No to Drama, Chetna slices through the drama of bad boss behavior and shares what it takes to be a good boss. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our others for that matter, please do tell a friend. We really appreciate you spreading this. Word of mouth helps a lot. And finally, this week, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Cred, Bank of Baroda, Quarter, CoinSwitch, Kuber, Slay Coffee, and Intel. We really appreciate the support. given the unprecedented times our nation is going through where positive is now a dreaded word smile india gets you delightful news from across the country about people and places that continue to spread the much needed hope and positive vibes i am shifa maitra and you can hear smile india with me every thursday on the ivm app website or wherever you get your podcasts from oh and did i tell you smile india is available in both english and hindi